Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Troy Moling and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Really good information for you on today's broadcast, so what do you say, let's get right into it. And we are beginning the show today by looking at corn and soybean planting. And when it comes to planting, Nebraska is ahead of the five-year average at 86% of corn and 71% of soybeans in the ground. For the country as a whole, 80% of corn and 61% of soybeans are planted. This all according to the latest crop progress report from the USDA. I was joined by North Dakota State University's Frayne Olson this week to talk about the corn and soybean markets, but we began with how some recent infrastructure issues are impacting agriculture. Frayne, I know you've been following a bridge issue out in Memphis that has slowed barge traffic and impacted shipments along the Mississippi River. What are the effects we're seeing with exports and grain prices? Well, you know, uh, the, the biggest, probably the biggest immediate effect would be some of the change in the basis levels. And again, the, the basis is really your local market trying to regulate the flow of grain. And so when, when the barge traffic was halted, uh, obviously there were some of those barges were, were hauling grain down to the export markets. Um, as a result, depending upon the timing and the arrival of the ocean vessels and the throughput time they needed, uh, there's some of that grain had to be rerouted. They had to kind of find an alternative route, find some alternative bushels to be able to fill, not knowing exactly how long the barge traffic would be halted. So uh, there, was a, there was a temporary spike in some of the, the basis levels at the export terminals. But this should be a short-term impact. I don't, you know, as long as they now have reopened at least the barge traffic, the bridge is still closed, but the barge tra traffic has reopened. Um, it will take a little bit of time to work through that backlog, but again, it wasn't shut down for an extended period of time. Um, and, and so the, the system should be able to, to rework through that and we should be able to stabilize. The bigger question, the longer term question is, is this a, a, um, an indication of other problems that might be coming in the future? We've been talking about concerns about the aging of our locks and dam system along the major tributaries of the Mississippi, as well as the main channel of the Mississippi. You know, we rely on that for agricultural trade significantly for not only the grain movement from the middle of the country down to the, the, the ports, but also for fertilizer transportation from the ports back through the system, especially in the spring and the fall. So, um, you know, this is one thing that I, I, we, we have been dealing with for a while with temporary shutdowns of the locks and dam system. This happened to be a bridge that's caused the, the, the difficulty. So where we go from here is really, in my mind, uh, the bigger question. And next up, as we take a look at planting progress and growing season, we've had some dryness in Nebraska, but from what I understand, fair share of concerns up your way in North Dakota too, right? Absolutely, yep. When, when you look at both the drought monitor maps as well as additional soil moisture maps, uh, up in our region, we're exceptionally dry. Now, fortunately, the forecast going for the next several days is to get some rainfall. We've been making very rapid planting progress, again, because it was so dry. We've had a, a, a little bit of a cool spring season, but uh, that really hasn't impacted things tremendously. Soil moisture, I mean, soil temperatures are starting to rise. Uh, we've been making very rapid planting progress. The, the issue right now is a lot of that seed is sitting in dry dirt. We'd really like to have some rain showers come through to try and get a nice even stand, a good jump to the spring season. Uh, but unfortunately, because our, our subsoil is so dry, we're going to be battling this or living this rain shower to rain shower for an extended time. So we're, this is something that is not going to go away quickly, and we're going to be talking about all summer long. And Frank, let me get a word in with you on wheat. We've got the lower dollar corn prices and winter wheat condition. Which of those are playing into the movements in the wheat market? Yeah, so all of the above, right? Um, the wheat complex as, as a class of a group of different types of wheat, spring wheat, winter wheat, the soft reds, you know, as a class of wheat, you know, we have adequate supplies. Unlike corn and soybeans where our ending stocks are starting to get tight, the market's getting a bit uncomfortable, we still have a very uh, adequate supply base and reserve of wheat and wheat stocks. The other thing is we haven't seen the, 
the expansion of wheat export market like we did in the soybean and the corn market. So our wheat exports are good, but they're not, they're, they're normal or typical. Um, we're starting to get some yield reports now out of Kansas. The Kansas wheat tour is going on. It looks as though the Kansas wheat crop is going to be a, a very good crop this year, above average yields. We'll wait to see a little bit on what the quality profile is. There are some concerns about spring wheat, uh, not only here in the United States, but also in Canada, because that dry area in, in North Dakota and Montana extends into Manitoba and Saskatchewan, which are major uh, spring wheat as well as canola producing regions. So the wheat market is under a little bit different set of dynamics. As corn prices come up, wheat is an alternative feed source, in particular for poultry as well as the beef industry. The poultry folks can flip very quickly between feeding corn and feeding wheat. So when corn prices are high, the wheat market is impacted by the higher corn prices. When corn prices are relatively low, the wheat supply and demand conditions kind of do their own thing. So right now, the wheat market is following the corn market very, very closely because our supply and demand conditions in the wheat, we have adequate supplies right now. So we are looking to the corn market for direction as, and, and we've seen that now as corn prices uh, have increased, we saw a rebound in wheat. Now as corn prices have started to soften again, the wheat complex is starting to drop as well. And a question I've been seeing from folks and I wanna get your take on it as well. Are the highs for corn and soybeans in or is there more to come? Well, that's, that's a hotly debated topic. My, my personal bias, my personal opinion, as long as we get some, some typical rain showers, we get some typical growing season weather, I think the highs may have been, been posted. However, again, for corn and soybeans, our carryover stocks, our reserves are so tight. And even when you look into the forecasted 2021 uh, numbers, you know, we need an average yield or better to be able to meet the demand base that's currently forecasted. So this is going to be a hotly debated topic. If there's any kind of weather questions or concerns this summer, we can definitely see spike price spikes that will reach these levels or exceed them. So right now it's really driven by weather. If we have a typical season this year, I suspect we have seen the highs, but it's, uh, it's up to mother nature at this point. Next week, we'll be joined by the University of Missouri, Scott Brown. If you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, email us or get in touch on social media, and I'll pass your question along. And before we leave markets today, you've probably noticed that whenever we have lakefront futures and options market strategist Darren Fessler on the show, he's got quite the setup behind him to track everything happening in the markets. Well, I wanted to know everything he's watching and how it can help a farmer become more informed on the markets. Every analyst, every trader um, it has a different setup. Now, granted, I, I particularly like, you know, multiple screen setups because I don't like flipping back and forth a lot. So a lot of the screens behind me were tracking the grains, energies, uh, obviously the livestock markets. I want to know what's going on in soy, meal, soy, oil, obviously a byproduct of beans. But then we'll have multiple screens, one for charting. The other screen right in front of me is all real-time data, real-time prices, client, um, execution, all that sort of stuff. I have one screen dedicated to social media and Twitter because I want to know what's happening real time. What are the what are traders thinking? What are farmers thinking at real time? Twitter is a great great resource for that. But mostly, it's 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 for my if, if I'm trading something, it's for my tracking. What are the setups looking like from a technical pattern? Do we need to be selling here? What are some other strategies, especially if we have like a, you know, a falling wedge, which is a bullish strategy or a rising wedge, which is a bearish strategy. Uh, how do we implement this? So it's, it's all for, you know, it's it, every screen gets utilized daily and it, it's basically to help me gather some of my thoughts, some of the strategy um, as we go forward here for clients and, uh, and hedgers. Appreciate that insight from Darren. We'll have him back on the show again real soon. And next up, many farmers and ranchers know the struggle of controlling musk thistle on their pasture. Musk thistle is a designated noxious weed under the Nebraska Department of Agriculture's Noxious Weed Program. Market Journal's Maddie McIntosh spoke with Nebraska Extension Range and Forage Specialist Jerry Valeski to learn the best management options. 
Well, musk thistle is one of several noxious weeds that uh, we have in Nebraska, and its distribution is pretty much statewide, but it's probably more common in central and eastern part of the states and has the characteristic of purple flowers that are on top of a pretty long stalk and very spiny, of course, and it's uh, you don't want to touch it without some good, good leather gloves on. It is, uh, acts as a biennial, and by that I mean the seeds germinate in late summer or fall of the previous year, and then it remains in this what we call a rosette stage, and so that's basically the form where it has a very low to the ground, but it's a circular rosette, if you will. In the spring of the year, through about uh, May, it does remain and continue to grow in that rosette stage, but then uh, once we typically get into June, that plant will send up a stalk, or we call it bolting, upon those or upon that, that is where the, the purple flowers form and gives us the pretty easily recognized musk thistle plant. If you had musk thistle in your fields last year, chances are it'll show up again this season. To effectively get rid of the weed, you need to pay close attention to timing and spray before the flowering begins. There are, are several herbicides that uh, are recommended for musk thistle control. Some popular ones include Milestone, Graze on Next, uh, Gunslinger P plus D, um, other herbicides as well, such as Chaparral, Cimarron, and Curtail can work, and then also even a mix of 2,4-D and Dicama. But the key to this is to uh, is the timing of the application. So they can, and many people do, um, apply herbicides to treat musk thistle in the fall of the year. But then again, an other, an, the other critical time or effective time would be the spring. If the weed has already flowered and formed a waxy layer on the leaves, herbicides may not be effective. However, there are manual ways to try and get it under control. Getting that uh, herbicide applied while it's in the rosette stage or just barely starting to bolt um, pretty much here through May is uh, the time to go. And then once we get after that and it has uh, actually got into that flowering stage, um, herbicides are, are not very effective at all. And so it just comes down to some mechanical treatment with a shovel or hoe, or uh, other people have uh, spent the time to chop off the heads, the flowering heads of that musk thistle and actually collect those and dispose of them later. Even if you sprayed before, musk thistle is persistent and can hide in fields, meaning there's a high likelihood it'll show up again next season. So, um, I think it's it's a very persistent plant that you know has to be some control done on every year and and sometimes uh, it's difficult to see those small rosettes depending on the amount of grass you've got growing around there too. So even if you did spray last fall, it's likely that you missed some and they're going to be there this spring. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Maddie McIntosh. Thanks, Maddie. Dr. Valeski also wants to remind producers to read all label instructions before using any herbicides and to follow all safety precautions while spraying. Next up, any farmer will tell you that pests and diseases play a significant part in limiting crop yields. Treatment is often most effective when these problems are identified early and correctly. UNL's Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic is a one-stop shop for diagnosing a producer's plant and pest issues, but as the pandemic impacted many parts of life and agriculture, plant and pest diagnostics extension educator Kyle Broderick says it was no different for the clinic. Last summer, unfortunately, we were not able to, um, to provide all of the services that we, that we wanted to, just due to, due to everything that was going on, but luckily now we are back at pretty much full capacity. For the most part, we are, we are back to our, our roughly five day turnaround time at most. Um, often, if we can, we try to get those sample, to get those results sent out um, much, much sooner than five days. And with planting nearing completion, threats of disease and pests will be ramping up. If you're submitting a sample, Kyle says there are some things to remember. But when it comes to submitting the sample, we do always ask that um, you put it in, um, you enclose, enclose the sample in a, in a sealable plastic bag. That helps keep things fresh in the meantime and provide as much material as you can. 
Um, and so often that will include a root ball and that's what we have right here. So we have some wheat that came in. The root ball is enclosed here in a, um, in a paper towel to kind of keep some of that soil off of the leaves. And, but when we have that whole plant, including the roots, this, um, that allows the sample to stay in decent condition at least for a cut for another couple of days. Um, and if you are going to mail a sample in, we ask that you don't send this, you don't mail the sample on a Thursday or a Friday. When that happens, normally that sample ends up sitting in the back of a mail truck or in a mail sorting facility for two to three days. And by the time we get it, it may be complete mush. And sometimes we then have to ask that, that another sample is submitted. And nobody wants to have to send something in twice. If you have any questions about disease or pest samples or have something you'd like to send in, you can call or email Kyle directly. We've got the information right there on the screen and you can find it on the Market Journal website as well. Next up, the Beef Quality Assurance Program or BQA is a voluntary producer program which is also nationally coordinated and state implemented. It provides systematic information in order to maximize consumer confidence in the beef industry by focusing attention on production practices that influence the safety and quality of beef and beef products. Nebraska Extension Educator Jesse Fulton is the director of Nebraska BQA, and he spoke with Market Journal's Bill Dodd about the benefits of becoming BQA certified. Back in the 1970s and 80s, a number of cattlemen had some concern about government regulation within their operation and throughout the industry. What was born out of their work with the USDA was the Pre-Harvest Safety Production Program, which laid the foundation for today's Beef Quality Assurance Program. Since its inception, the BQA program has done a lot of good for our country's beef industry. And this concern was coming because of the amount of violative residues uh, that we were seeing in beef packing plants. So, you know, that's the first thing uh, that the BQA program has done for the beef industry is we have greatly reduced those violative residues. The last time we did a research project looking at the amount of violative residues or injection site lesions uh, in, in beef product uh, was in 2003, and that percentage had dropped to less than 3%. Um, today, uh, we really don't see a lot of those just because the BQA program has really worked to help producers focus on keeping good records to make sure they don't market any cattle that haven't cleared their withdrawal periods. Um, another thing that the BQA program has done is made great strides in animal welfare and animal handling or cattle handling from facility design and how those uh, employees or cattle owners are trained and how they handle their cattle and using the principles that cattle, you know, their natural instincts uh, of how they flow in facilities when working them. One of the most beneficial aspects of the BQA program is the fact that it can be a profitable endeavor for those producers who choose to become certified and follow BQA guidelines. So the BQA program has financially benefited producers uh, for a while. Um, there's some programs in other states that actually require the BQA program to participate in uh, programs where there is a premium added to those feeder cattle or fed cattle when they're sold. Um, you know, the National Beef Checkoff did a research project back in 2019 where they were investigating uh, the value BQA added to cattle that were sold in uh, virtual auction or so like online auction and what it was was uh any time BQA was mentioned or those cattle were, were, it was mentioned those cattle were raised under BQA guidelines, uh, those animals brought an additional $2.71 per hundredweight or $16.80 per head. So there is value in BQA um, ex, uh, for our producers. Uh, it's great for producers to be able to capture that value as well when they are BQA certified. Another reason BQA certification is so beneficial to cattle producers is the fact that it builds strong consumer confidence in the quality of beef products that are hitting supermarket shelves by highlighting the care and attention that goes into raising beef cattle. It's very important because, uh, you know, our product going out to the consumers, the consumers do have an opinion on what they purchase at the grocery store. Uh, we have consumer market research out there that shows us that, especially when it relates to the beef industry. So in 2017, the National Beef Checkoff did a consumer market research when they were uh, asking consumers unaided just uh, what concerns they have about the beef industry. 61% of those consumers mentioned a concern 
And more than half of those consumers mentioned animal welfare was their concern when it comes to purchasing beef from the grocery store. Now in 2019, we followed up with a different uh, consumer market research project. And in that project, we asked them uh, what impacted their purchasing decisions of beef at the grocery store. 68% of those consumers uh, said how those animals were raised and cared for on the operation. So that just shows us right there how important animal welfare is to consumers. Um, so so we need to make sure that we are uh, going as far as we can to ensuring proper animal welfare and the care of those animals um, that are going to be, become a consumer uh, protein product so that they'll continue to purchase our product from the grocery stores. When it comes to getting BQA certified, there are online or in-person options available. While both are excellent training programs, Jesse feels the in-person option is the way to go. Um, you can, the one we highly recommend is getting certified in person. Uh, when you come to a BQA certification training, uh, you know, it's, it's a PowerPoint presentation that we're going to go through the guidelines of BQA, things that you should be implementing on your operation to follow those BQA guidelines. Um, it's pretty easy. We get through it in about uh, an hour and a half to two hours um, where we just cover a lot of those guidelines. Now, if the opportunity presents itself to where we can go shoot side, uh, we'll definitely do a shoot side demonstration just showing uh, proper cattle handling practices and then proper uh, uh, animal health product handling practices, as well as proper injection site administration. Now, you know, we know our producers are busy and they, they don't always have time to get away from their operation to come to a BQA training. So that's why there is an online uh, option for those producers. They can go to BQA.org and it's a free online certification that they can do at their own pace um, and it's available 24 seven for them. All in all, it doesn't matter how superior of a product we're producing if consumers don't purchase it. As it stands today, over 80% of the beef industry is maintained under BQA guidelines, giving consumers more confidence in the products they buy and a better market price for beef producers. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks, Bill. If you'd like to become BQA certified, you're encouraged to reach out to your local veterinarian or Nebraska beef extension educator. You can also find in-person BQA training in your area by visiting bqa.unl.edu. We've also included that link and more information about BQA on the Market Journal website. Next up, Nebraska Land Link is accepting applications from interested land seekers and landowners with the goal of providing land access using lease agreements, lease to own arrangements, buy sell arrangements, or other creative methods that are mutually beneficial for both parties. Access to land is a big challenge for new farmers, so LandLink is one way to help with that process. It's open to operations of any size and is free for Nebraskans. To learn more about enrollment and all the details of the program, check out the April-May issue of Nebraska Farmer. Finally today, we are ending things with weather and Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist Al Dutcher. Hope you've had a good week, Al. What are you tracking in the weather? Well, Troy, yes, I did have th a good weekend, and thank you for that. Uh, unfortunately, no sunbathing weather, really, for much of eastern Nebraska in the last few days. We finally peaked some sun yesterday, but for the most part, we've been stuck in this overcast, gloomy-type conditions of periodic showers. And over the week, even though we were seeing very light amounts, we did see some decent accumulations over parts of the state, particularly the southwest, where there was a pretty wide area of two to four inch rainfall in the northern half of the southwestern corner of the state. And then, of course, the big loser was a, it was the southern portion of the Panhandle and extreme northeastern Nebraska. It just seems like we missed out on most of the precipitation. But overall, from the very extreme northeastern corner of the Panhandle, southeastward through central and south central Nebraska, there was a lot of widespread one punch inch totals according to the NE Rain Network. So overall, a little bit, little bit of everything. We did get that precipitation, but more importantly, huge amount of moisture lifting toward the north, and it looks like we're gonna finally start to see some significant moisture across the northern plains. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see what we have in store. Here's that big upper air low. The first piece of energy in that wave last week had moved to the south of us. This is really pumping up the moisture, and, and we also have a high pressure block to the southeast. 
funneling that moisture up around the periphery of that high and intersecting with that low pressure system that's coming in to the Pacific Northwest. So we do see this moisture feed here this morning up through the High Plains region and we'll expect that that will continue as the day progresses. In fact, another piece of energy rolls out as we go through tomorrow morning. So expect to see thunderstorm development on a frequent basis across the western part of the state and then we'll see some of that slide toward the east so as we go to tomorrow you'll see the precipitation trying to break out across the east and that will start to pivot toward the east as we go into the day as that low pressure system itself in the upper atmosphere starts to slide across north dakota so we're looking at some very significant moisture across the northern rockies and portions of north dakota in from one to three inches of moisture particularly in the northern rockies where we're seeing anywhere from one to three feet of snow now by tuesday the system starts to open up and lift toward the Great Lakes, but you'll notice we still have kind of a troughing pattern in the west. So with that low over the Texas Panhandle, that's going to help funnel moisture toward the north to intersect the front that will be driving through the region. And the timing of this front is critical for whether or not we see severe weather in eastern Nebraska, but it looks like a decent chance at least in, in Tuesday for our region. We still keep a slight southwesterly flow. We still have that high pressure blocking in the southeast, so there is going to be some moisture wrap around with it, just not as conducive as what we see the earlier in the week. As most of the moisture starts to slip off to the eastern United States. By Thursday, another low pressure system starts to enter into the northern Rockies, and this one also will start to move toward the northern plains. So we're still going to see that moisture fetch up toward the north, and the GFS model at least is showing that we should see a decent outbreak of thunderstorm activity across the central and northern plains. And by Friday, this trough starts to lift toward the Great Lakes. Low pressure still exists at the surface, or is projected to lift the surface in the, the Oklahoma Panhandle. That will keep that moisture feed toward the north, and we should see a widespread area of scattered shower and thunderstorm activity. This, all this moisture is expected to pivot toward the Great Lakes region, pretty much bypassing the southeast, but in turn, we'll start to turn our uh, winds to a zonal flow, which means cooler conditions in the second half of the week will be back down to well normal to slightly below normal. Looked out the extended, yet another wave is expected to come in early June across the northern Rockies to keep this trend in continuation. High pressure still remains in place over the southeast, and in terms of precipitation with that setup, once again, above normal moisture for our region. Thanks, Al. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app, or you can follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. Next week, we'll get an update on Nebraska wheat condition and any potential problems. Plus, Scott Brown is here for a discussion on the cattle markets. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.